Back when Ryzen 3000 launched, there was reasonable speculation founded in basic physics that the asymmetrical die arrangement of the CPUs with fewer chiplets could have implications for cooler performance. The idea was that, at the root of it, a cooler whose heat pipes aligned to fully contact above the die would perform better, as opposed to one with two heat pipes sharing vertical contact with the die. We still see a lot of online commentary about this and some threads about which orientation of a cooler is best, so we thought we'd bust a few of the myths that popped up, but also do some testing on the base idea. Before that, this video is brought to you by the MSI GTX 1660 Super Gaming X. The GTX 1660 Super is a strong mid-range performer that's capable of 1440p gaming without issue, and MSI's Gaming X variant uses a dual fan cooler with a more traditional two-slot design for versatility. It also has RGB LEDs, of course. Learn more at the link below. This is pretty old news by now, with much of the original discussion starting about two months ago, but it's still alive. And Noctua recently revived this issue at the end of no October. <laughs> Noctober. Noctua Tober. At the end of October, by stating that it believed there to be no meaningful impact on the performance thermally of the CPU based upon the orientation of the cooler. Now, this is not a Noctua cooler I have on the table here, but. Uh, the idea was that if you have a cooler like this versus like this, there was a difference purely from the level of contact or the, the type of contact with the heat pipes between the underlying die under the IHS and the cooler itself, ignoring all other variables like the case. That was the theory. So this is something that's unique to Ryzen, Ryzen 3000 especially, because we're used to monolithic dies from Intel and from AMD in the past, but these asymmetrical multi-chip approaches are still somewhat new. The new Ryzen CPUs are arranged in a few different ways. The first round of CPUs, the more cut down version of what became the 3950X, host a CPU die and an IO die. And the CPU die contains all of the cache, the cores, the IO die contains the IO, as you would expect. The 3950X is different. It hosts two dies for the cores and the cache and one for the IO still. This modular approach means that all of them are asymmetrical to some extent, but the 3950X is arguably a little bit less asymmetrical because it's got the full saturation of the substrate, uh, other than the IO die is kind of off alone. So a 3800X versus a 3950X will have one delta of, of amount of silicon dies on the board, on the substrate that is. Because of this asymmetrical die arrangement, we've had viewers email us to ask if a Noctua NHU14S would work better on a Ryzen CPU than the much larger NHD15, entirely predicated on the idea that the heat pipe alignment would be more efficient. And if you look at the NHD15, its heat pipes are front to back, whereas the U14S are left to right, and that's where that came from. A few of the comments we found online also include these. Quote, it's not whether you have one or two or 93 towers, but whether just one or two heat pipes end up being the ones, the only ones covering the compute dies. Another quote, Single tower coolers usually have heat pipes running vertically when looking at the CPU as we see on the thumbnail of the quoted video, which would mean at least two out of the four heat pipes would cover the chiplet. If the single tower were to be rotated 90 degrees, it would still be the same, roughly two heat pipes directly contacting it. But in this case, or in the case of dual tower coolers, because the heat pipes run horizontally with the two chiplet CPU, both chiplets would be completely covered by the same heat pipes. And this actually is just a, a summation comment of what you saw in the uh, the discussion. Another quote, a final one, this means that most, if not all, cooling solutions available on the market for Zen 2 are ineffective since the dies are set in asymmetric, non-central fashion, and that's why most people can't reach advertised boosts. This is, this last one's just an illustration of how Reddit sees something and goes absolutely, completely crazy, certifiably insane with it. These are two separate issues. <sighs> we don't really need to dig into it really any further than that, but Jumping from the base idea, which does make sense of, hey, there's heat sources in asymmetrical locations, maybe that impacts things, to all coolers are ineffective is quite a large jump. Anyway, maybe try and keep that in check. And if everyone could just like kind of cool it a little bit on the sensationalism, the dramatic responses, that'd be great. So you get the idea. It's worth still trying this for ourselves since we don't really trust random internet user data. There's some of that out there, but thermal testing is hard and we reran these tests two separate sets of times, not two times, but two sets of times for a total of a couple dozen verification passes between the three coolers 
and two CPUs tested. Noctua is one of the few companies that does offer mounting hardware for both orientations. So we used three Noctua coolers for this. It made sense, small, medium, and large. And uh, Noctua also has come out publicly with its own statement dismissing the idea that there's a difference here. So we thought, well, we already have some data that we can source from them, so we might as well just validate. And relatedly, the three models we, we're testing are the NHE-12S, U14S, and NHD-15, the large one which is a dual tower, dual fan solution versus single tower, single fan for the others. Looking at the NHD15, NHU14S, you'll see again, it's left to right versus front to back for the heat pipe orientation. And then uh, that's where the theories popped up. So first of all, if you're building in a case, which almost everybody watching this will be, this is all basically completely irrelevant because when you build in a case, your limitation is not going to be the die arrangement and the centralization of heat in a, a square on the motherboard. Your issue is going to be the panels of the case, the airflow capabilities of the case, the fans in the case, the positioning of the fans in the case, the positioning of other components in the case, like the video card and things like that. So a bad case can't be fixed by ultra optimized die to heat pipe positioning. You're wasting your time even worrying about it. A cooler that only fits in one orientation, likely for GPU or RAM clearance reasons, is obviously not usable in another orientation. So not worth worrying about there either. If you've got a cooler smashed against a glass panel on the top or double filters, it's going to have a bad time. Again, no reason to worry. Likewise, using the top PCIe slot will smash a GPU right up against a lot of tower coolers, which is about the worst possible configuration. That's because, clearly, the GPU is a massive heat source that's potentially responsible for dumping 200, 250 watts of heat into your case. A lot of that is radiative heat off the backside of the GPU, which would get sucked into the cooler. The next aspect is that the GPU acts like a massive wall to airflow. So the fan is going to need all the static pressure it can get to fight the wall in front of it. These things alone mean that in nearly every instance of a standard non-inverted and non-rotated ATX case, a front to back configuration is likely the best solution. Probably not always, but nearly always. Most people on the internet in general, unfortunately care more about seeing results than talking about how they are gotten different societal discussion. So let's get into the results first, and then we'll talk about some of the testing parameters because these have to be very controlled when we're looking for something that might be a very small difference. We'll talk conclusions after that. We'll present the Noctua NHD15 results on the 3800X first, and then talk about the 3950X and some of the other coolers. They use different die configurations between the different CPUs, so this allows us to better see if the heat distribution changes in a meaningful way when there is an asymmetrical die layout under the IHS. Of course, there is a change in the precise position of heat sources under the heat spreader, obviously, but the real question is whether that matters, whether that impacts the T-dye measurement when considering that solder and IHS, multiple layers of metal in between, and then TIM and then a heat sink are all part of the cooling solution. With the 3800X and the D15, looking at the first chart, we were unable to measure a difference outside of our error. We ran these tests six times or so and ended up with a 53.9 degree result for the rotated airflow pattern, e.g. with air coming from the direction of the video card, and then 52.6 degrees for the standard front to back orientation. The video card here is a half height passive GT1030 in the bottom most compatible PCIe slot of the board, so it's as out of the way as it can be, and it's also short, but it's obviously possible there's some very minor detriment from the video card's presence. We couldn't find a reliable difference though between these results even with that consideration. So these are functionally identical. Just for quick reference, we'll highlight the VRM thermals on the board as well. VRM thermals are largely unchanged from this rotation. On an open bench, all variables well controlled, there is zero difference in the rotation of this cooler. Again, the biggest change will come from adding a case and a bigger, closer video card to the mix, which would obviously benefit more from a front to back airflow path than bottom to top. Even if the Ryzen 3000 dies did care about this, which they don't really seem to after considering the IHS, the solder and everything else in between to cool it, it would still be cooler to orient it front to back in a standard case layout, unless you're working with an inverted case or something like that. But in a standard normal ATX case, because of the positioning of the panels, the presence of the panels, the case fans, the proximity of a big heat source that's also a wall, that'd be the GPU, all of these things would affect thermals more than just the die layout would. And die layout doesn't appear to affect thermals either, which is why we test this 
on an open bench with none of those other variables or constraints. Just in case, we tested the full 3950X chip with the same set of benchmarks. This one still isn't technically symmetrical, but it's not missing a die or a chiplet like the lower end CPUs are. After six tests, these were identical. We were at 58.6 to 58.9 degrees, posting no difference outside of error. VRM thermals were predictably higher for the 3950X rather than the 3800X, but that's not what we're comparing today. You also shouldn't compare the temperature of the 3800X and the 3950X with these charts. That's why they are isolated on different charts, because they were tested with different voltages. So that makes them incomparable. You can't just look at one versus the other. The 3950X binned better, so it's lower voltage. So relative to running at the same voltage of the 3800X, it's less power than it would be. Anyway. The two orientations, the bottom to top configuration ran warmer for the left side VRM and cooler for the top side VRM sensor, which is completely predictable and normal. That's just because of where the air is going and not for any other reason. Back to the 3800X, the NHU14S ran at 56 degrees T-dye when oriented bottom to top or 55.3 degrees T-dye when oriented front to back. This is again within test variance and error, which is about plus or minus one degree here. It doesn't matter what the die layout is in this testing. We'll skip the VRM thermals for this one since they're irrelevant and also scale in the same way as the last two tests, but they're on the screen if you really care about them. Finally, the last chart, the Noctua NH-U12S on the 3800X can also be rotated. So we tested that one as well. In this instance, the result was 60.4 degrees for the bottom top airflow and 59.6 degrees. For the front back airflow, our bottom top results are technically always between 0.7-ish and 1.3 degrees different, always favoring the front back configuration. Although a pattern is forming, and although it's tempting to say that the benefit is always for one configuration, we can't call this causation. It could be the somewhat distant but still closed video card, for example, in the lower slot, or something else we're not accounting for, maybe the RAM even though we position the fan in the same spot each time, the RAM could also impact. So we have to call these results functionally the same. As for testing, let's talk about this briefly and then get to the conclusion. So the charts have some of the specs for the testing we set up. And most of those that are relevant would be things, things like the frequency and the voltage for the CPU. That's very important. Things that need to be controlled that we did control. Positioning of bench in the room. If you're not testing in a thermal chamber, we've done that in the past too, but if you're not testing in a thermal chamber and you're testing in a normal room, you need to be aware of the position of the bench, the position of the ventilation in the ceiling, and the status of the air conditioning or heating. We never use heating here. <laughs> Go figure. We don't really need it. And uh, air conditioning is, is heavily controlled for our testing. Separately, you need the ambient temperature at the inlet of the CPU cooler. We monitor this second to second with a thermocouple. We drop that data into the spreadsheet and then we produce delta t over ambient values in instances like this we don't always use delta t over ambient like when we know two devices are precisely controlled and can be directly compared with their base results but delta t over ambient is a simple subtraction of the ambient temperature from the temperature measured at the die level the component level this scales mostly linearly for the first at least couple degrees maybe five to ten or so and then it stops scaling linearly after that but because we're never more than maybe one to three degrees different, it's, this is the best way to do it, and it controls things very well. Uh, next one, CPU core voltage must be fixed. That's the biggest. If you leave that auto, everything you do is invalid. CPU SOC voltage must be fixed. All minor voltages should be fixed. Fan position and cooler must be controlled, obviously. For the D15, we ensured that its fans were in the exact same vertical position for all the tests. We drew an outline of the uh, clips on the cooler so that we could place them in the same spot. Moving these fans even one inch in either direction can influence the results by a couple of degrees depending on where it's positioned on the test bench, which direction it's in. The same thermal compound has to be used. We use manually spread Asetek compound. We manually spread it so that we know how much is used. In the past, we've used things like graduated syringes as well to help control the amount, uh, although we have better methods these days. Blender 2.79 and the GN logo is used for the CPU load. We monitor the CPU power consumption every second of the, t actually every millisecond of the test and use that to determine uh, that the power load is the same for all the tests. And then the last few points here, the render is held for approximately 23 minutes, which is sufficient to reach steady state after just the first couple minutes. And then we average from a steady state, we average a couple hundred rows of data, cells of data, to uh, get our numbers that we report, and then we mo do multiple test passes and average those. So you're averaging uh, thousands of cells of temperature data. CPU temperature is, 
is uh, reported as TDI, which is measured in hardware info. That's probably about all we really need to talk about here. So conclusions. One of the earlier claims we saw that got a lot of traction on Reddit was that the NHU-14S would perform better than the NHD-15 due to the heat pipes alone. And even in a perfect environment, an open air bench, we cannot reproduce those claims. And it's safe to say that they are wrong at this point. We're not going to be able to rep reproduce those claims ever. So the only reason that might be true is if it's something to do with the positioning in the case and the obstructions to the cooler in that case. That's the only reason that would ever matter, not the dyes. So as we've shown tonight, that's, that's patently false. We're also unable to validate the claims in general that the heat sources particularly matter for overall, uh, like heat source versus heat pipe orientation and alignment doesn't really seem to matter on these three coolers. Now we haven't tested everything and maybe maybe something like a, an open loop block, for example, where you're dealing with jet plates, that might matter a bit more, but we haven't tested that. So it's, and, and also to be frank, when you're talking about that level of cooling, the delta is probably going to be basically irrelevant anyway, even if it is a couple of degrees, because you're already so cold with one of those. But with what we've tested today, we feel fairly confident in stating that there's no meaningful difference and that you shouldn't worry about it at all and you should continue about your day and worry only about things like how does it all fit within the case and the build as a whole, not how does it align with the dies on your CPU. You don't need to start drawing like Da Vinci code diagrams on your CPU to figure out how to place your cooler. Just put the damn cooler on the die and do it based on where your video card is and where your air intake is for the case, probably front to back in nearly all instances, unless you're working with like a Raven O2. Well, even that rotates it. So unless you're working with a case that rotates it in a way where it's not facing the fans anymore, then you can rotate the cooler. That's it. You'll get a bigger change from repositioning the fans in the case. So thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. Come to store.gamersnexus.net if you'd like to pick up some of our uh, mod mats or shirts. And it, the way I phrased that made it sound like it's, it's, it's like a retail store, but it's on the internet. You might be aware of it. You can also go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. We'll see you all next time.